<clears throat> Most of you have heard the story about post-it notes. You probably haven't heard that post-it notes came to be because of church. You may not have heard that part, did you? How many of you heard that part? Yeah, you didn't probably because no secular book puts that. So let me tell you how post-it notes really came about. In 1968, this guy named Spencer Silver came up with the, this glue uh, for 3M that would stick and then not stick. And so it wouldn't tear up paper. And 3M looked at him and said, um, no, no, we need glue that will never let go. Like you glue stuff and it will be glued forever. It will, you know, the wood will break before the glue breaks. You know, that's the kind of glue we want. But he was persistent. To the point that he would go to every meeting and he would talk about the glue he had invented and can they come up with ways to use it. And everybody started calling him Mr. Persistent, or as we know, Mr. Aggravation. About 14 years later, uh, one of his colleagues, Art Fry, was singing in the church choir. And so he was in the church choir and he did what you do in the church choir. You had to mark the different pages in the hymn book with pieces of paper. And as he got up to sing out of the hymn book and he did what you do and opened the hymn book, all the pieces of paper fell out and he could not find his way around. And then he thought, wait a second, my friend at 3M was talking the other day about some glue. Now this is after 14 years of giving the same speech, I'm sure over and over and over. And he said, you know, I bet you if we put that on some paper that it would stick and then I could take it off after choir practice. So sure enough, he came to choir practice, did it, and all the other people in the choir wanted what became post-it notes. And then they took it to work and they started using them and they didn't even have to market it. They started using it at work and sticking into things and of course then everybody wanted it. And you now are addicted to post-it notes. Here's how easy it is. Now, these guys, because they were engineers for a large corporation, those of you who know how it works, they did not get the money from their invention. However, they have a comfortable retirement. I think their company took good care of them. However, he said one of the best benefits of inventing this was that when they watch movies, they notice these computers where you can type anything you want, and as they focus in on the computer, they notice that all around the computer are 3M post-it notes all the way around the computer. How many of you have a 3M post-it note somewhere on the computer at work, right? Is, does that, that's kind of crazy. You realize that's crazy, right? Okay, but anyway, actually, here's what's interesting. This computer actually has a program so that I can put post-it notes virtually in the computer. So that's how far this idea has spread because of a guy who came up with an invention and he did not give up on what he thought was important. And then some choir member, you choir members, some choir member who said, I need to mark my book. And now today you have post-it notes everywhere. Some of you, let me just be honest, too many. You've got too many. You don't even know what's on them anymore. So throw a few of those away when you get home. So here's what we're going to talk about today. How can I persist when vision dies? I am sure for this man, Spencer Silver, that he got tired of telling people about glue that stuck and unstuck. And over the years, he had to think year after year after year as people basically were aggravated with him. He had to think, well, maybe this isn't useful. And yet today, it's one of the most useful things. Listen. For all of us, if you go through scripture, for all of us, there's three real stages that will happen when you are going to have a dream for your life or going to have a vision for your life. And today we're going to talk about how can I persist when my vision dies? Because here's the three stages, okay? The first one is you're going to gain a vision. It's either your vision or God's vision. It's not always God's vision. Even if it's God's vision, you might tweak it, need to tweak it. And then your vision will die. And then the third step is then you'll have a restored vision, and you'll be able to follow through the way God wanted you to do in the beginning. But it always happens all through Scripture, whether it's Joseph or Moses or Father Abraham, who had many sons. It is all through Scripture, and today we're going to look at this guy named Paul. It's interesting because um, I taught, uh, you know, I teach out of the Bible all the time. Most of the New Testament was written by this guy named Paul. And lots of the Old Testament were written by this guy named Moses, both of whom had checkered histories, by the way, if you didn't know. And so um, somebody came to me one week and they said, Eric, you know, you were talking about this guy named Paul and, and then he wrote this. He said, she said, why should we listen to this guy, Paul? And who is he? 
And so today I'm going to, in the middle of this message, tell you a little bit about who Paul is. We're going to look at Acts chapter 9. But here's what happens. Number one, we get a vision that may not be God's. Forgive me. (coughs) That was just to get your attention. It really didn't need to call you. We get a vision that may not be God's. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. In Jerusalem, Saul, who would later become Paul, and they kind of use it interchangeably. It's funny, we don't really know who changed Paul's name to Paul. It just says, at one point in Scripture, it says, Saul, who was also called Paul, and then from then on they just refer to him as Paul. It's like, what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to be like, okay, who did that? Did you flip a coin? What, did they have a, a roulette wheel of names? How did Paul get his name? Anyway. So, in Jerusalem, Saul was still threatening the followers of the Lord by saying he would kill them. Can you imagine somebody who said, I'm going to kill anybody who goes to church? So he went to the high priest and asked him to write letters to the synagogues in the city of Damascus. Time out. I want to stop there for a second. If you're not careful, you'll just skip right over this sentence. Paul was so important. He was a student of a guy named Gamaliel, who is known to this day as an author of the oral law for Judaism. If you talk to a rabbi, Paul's teacher is one of the utmost teachers. So so Paul had some clout. He had so much clout that he was able to go to the high priest, just walk in, and like, I need some letters. It would be like if you could walk into your congressman's office and say, hey, listen, I need some letters to be able to kill people. Um, uh, That would be awesome. And the priest wrote in letters so that, listen, he could go anywhere, show the letters to the Romans, and the Romans would help him because of the authority he had to arrest anybody he wanted. So he basically went with an entourage of temple high priests, uh, of the guards from from the temple, and even Roman soldiers. So this was a powerful, powerful person. We underestimate that sometimes. Paul was also a Jew of all Jews. He followed the Jewish law. And and so it continues. And and then, if Paul or Saul found any followers of Christ's way, men or women, he would arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. So he had the authority to get people and bring them back because they had scattered. And so Paul now was going and getting them and bringing them back. So this was a guy who really was not only uh, against Christians, he was going to wipe out Christianity. Now, Paul may have even been in on the trial of Christ. That's what a lot of people don't realize. And he definitely was in on the the martyr, the first martyrdom of, uh, of Stephen, who was the first deacon in the church. And so he held the coat, so he was in approval of that. And here's the deal. As Paul went through life, he was headed on what he thought was a correct path. It looked easy to him. I follow the Jewish law. I wipe out anybody who doesn't agree with me. We do what we've always done. And he knew where he was headed until God. I believe all of us have that point in our life. Well, we really think we know our direction. We know what's going to happen. We know what's next. We have a plan for our lives. We've got a straight line from A to B, and we're going to follow our plan until God. And God allows trials, and he allows testing, and he allows difficulty in our lives. He sometimes tells us, hey, the plan that you have is not my plan. And other times he comes to us and says, yes, that's my plan, but I need to get all your selfishness out of the way first. So listen to this verse in 1 Peter. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So in this passage, the idea is that you have a vision. You have a way of thinking. You have a way of doing things. And God will allow these trials, these difficulties in your life, to show you, am I doing them for the right reasons? It it can be as simple as you're doing something to help somebody and they don't appreciate it. Or not only that, maybe you're doing something to help somebody and they attack you. That's the moment where the vision gets refined. See, before that, you thought you were doing it for God. But as soon as that person attacks you, you really do care what they think. And you have to start to say, 
Am I going to continue to do what God wants me to do, or am I going to let people, when they don't appreciate me, or they're not thankful, or I get hurt in church, that never happens, uh, 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 you know, am I going to allow that to stop me from what God wants me to do? God will allow that to happen so that it refines your faith, so that you begin to move that selfishness. So here's our first question today. Is the vision I have from God? There's a great quote from K. Arthur. I'm not going to read it, but you can read it on your own. We're going to go to point number two. So we get a vision that may or may not be God's. Number two, we often seek God when our visions die. It's that time of testing when we so often look to God. Like David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Listen, when we're in the valley and it's dark, there is no light except to look up. And when you're going through that valley, that darkness, that difficult time, and you're looking ahead, you don't see anything. And that's the time where God so often gets our attention. Most people who come to my office who need to visit with me don't come in saying, Eric, I want you to know everything is awesome. And I just wanted to meet with you to tell you how wonderful life is and how good God is. And I just want to meet with you today. I don't really need anything. But just wanted you to know God's good. Have a great day. Thanks for coming. No, most people come to my office, come in, and what do they say? I just, I don't know where God is. Or this happened to me and they lose their way because they're walking in that darkness of life, that, that valley of death. Rick Warren had a great uh, devotion, I think it was yesterday or Friday, which said, when you are staring at shadows in life, you get afraid. When, when you're staring at the shadows of life, you become afraid. When darkness comes, we get afraid. And the answer is not to look at the shadows, but to turn around and look at the light. When you're walking through that valley, I want to encourage you to look up. And those are the things that God uses. So listen to what happened. Acts chapter 9, 3 through 9. So Saul came towards Damascus. As he came near the city, a bright light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Saul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul said, who are you, Lord? The voice answered, I am Jesus. Now, time out. We just kind of read that because we know the rest of the story. But imagine if everything you built your life on in one moment, in just a few words, you realized was totally wrong. Everything that you had trusted, everything that you had put your faith in, everything that you had fought against, and suddenly in that moment you realize, I have been pursuing the wrong thing. By the way, this is the story of all of us who've become Christians. It's that moment that we realize, you know, maybe I was even religious. Maybe I was even doing Christian things. Maybe I was even going to church. But we have that moment when we have to realize, am I really trusting Christ or am I trusting myself? Am I really doing what God wants me to do? Or am I really doing what I want to do? And Paul had this moment when all of a sudden Christ appears to him and says, You are attacking me. Get up now and go into the city. Someone there will tell you what you must do. Listen to this. The people with Saul stood there but said nothing. They heard the voice. Now these were different people. May have been Roman soldiers. May have been temple guards. May have been just an entourage. They saw no one. So they could hear it, but they couldn't see anything. So his friends also heard the voice talking to him. That would freak you out, would it not? It continues. Saul got from the ground and opened his eyes, but he could not see. So those with Saul took his hand. This man who had just recently walked into the temple and said, I need letters. This man who could now command Roman soldiers, this man who had total authority, went from that to being led by his hand and led him into Damascus. For three days, Saul could not see and did not eat or drink. Everything he fought for fell apart. Everything, all the strength he had was suddenly gone. Listen, God will often get us to that point in our lives where we have no strength and we have a choice to curse God or to trust Him. When life gets dark and we can't do anything for ourselves, listen, God will even give you other believers that sometimes will just hold your hand as you go through darkness. And let me tell you, oftentimes when I visit with people, can I tell you that I don't have the right words to say? But so many people say, I'm so glad you were there. They have no idea what I said. 
So many people come to me and say, Larry, I go visit them, but I don't know what to say. It's not about that. Sometimes when people feel blinded by life and everything falling apart, they just need somebody there for them. That's the reason you need other believers, because we all go through this dark time. James 1 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. This guy's crazy. <laughs> Jesus' brother James is crazy. Mary had other children, by the way. Sorry. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials. How many after you went through the last trial, you said, This is awesome! Anybody? Just... One too many miracles in his life, right? So consider it joy whenever you face trials. Why? Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so some of you say it to me, Eric, I don't pray for patience because God might give it to me. I hate to tell you something. God's a good God. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, it starts out love, joy, peace. I like those. Number four fruit of the Spirit, patience. It's not like God goes, yeah, you didn't ask for it, so I'm not giving it to you. Mm -mm. No, no. He gives you patience no matter what you pray. He will come and give you patience. He will put you in traffic on I-4 in Orlando if you need it. <laughs> he will give you grandchildren. He will give you a neighbor. He will give you a neighbor that doesn't like you. He will allow you to go through and have a student who, yes, right? That testing of your faith. Are you going to do it for God or are you going to do it for yourself? When people do not satisfy your needs, are you going to trust God? Can I be faithful during times of testing? If you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. This part two of this message is the most important time in your life. Because you can destroy your life <laughs> and your witness during this time. When you don't feel good, how you treat others is the most important. When, when you don't feel good about your life or about yourself, how are you going to treat the people God's put in your path? And if you trust God, you can faith your way through the feelings. You can say, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to love people, even though these people treated me badly, I'm going to love anyway, and I'm going to forgive. Not because I have strength, but as I go through this time of darkness, this time of testing, I'm going to trust you. Can you be faithful? Number three, I like this one best, so I don't have to talk about it a lot because this part's easy. When we're faithful, God restores us. If you do what's right, God will restore you. But let me tell you something about God. He gives retakes. Some of you, the reason you keep dealing with the same situation is not because of the other people. It's the mirror you need. God's going to keep giving you retakes until he refines your character, until you learn how to deal with those issues. And if you move and get rid of that one neighbor, guess what? You move to the next house, it's going to give you the same neighbor. You move jobs and you go to the next job and that boss doesn't appreciate you, you will have that moment when you go, oh my goodness, I'm back in the same thing. I wonder what's happening to these other people. <laughs> he gives retakes. So pass it the first time. So Ananias went to the house of Judas. He laid his hands on Saul, who became Paul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me. He's the one you saw on the road on the way here. He sent me so that you can see and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something that looked like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes. And tell me, that's not cool. And he was able to see again. Then Saul got up, and what did he do immediately? He got baptized. Now, he was probably baptized as a Jew, but now he wanted to be baptized as a Christian. One of the reasons we don't baptize babies is just because... Uh, he was baptized when he was younger, but he wanted to be baptized after he had made a decision of faith. And so Paul said, hey, I want to be baptized. After he ate some food, his strength returns. Saul stayed with the followers of Jesus in Damascus for a few days. I love this next sentence. Soon he began to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. By the way, if he was in church today, we'd be like, no, no, you've got to take a few more classes. No, 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 have you become a member yet? No, no, have you done this yet? We can't, we can't let you, like, teach people. Listen, wait. Jesus is the Son of God. All the people who heard them were amazed. They said, this is the man who was in Jerusalem trying to destroy those who trust in this name. He came here to arrest the followers of Jesus and take them back to the leading priest. And let me let you know something. This is what God can do. And this is the reason I'm a pastor. If it was not for the fact that God can radically change people's lives, I would have quit a long time ago. A few years ago, a girl came to our church. Young lady, I should say a girl. 
came to our church and she said to me, this was her first words, and she told me I could tell this story. She came to me and she said these words, Eric, my psychologist told me I need to come to church because I'm so angry. I said, great. Now, you know, I'm thinking, oh, okay. Um, can you keep an eye on this one, right? It wasn't too long before she gave her life to Christ. I baptized her. I did her wedding just a few years ago. And here's the coolest part. I went to her workplace one day. I was talking to some other nurses at the hospital. And I said, oh, do you know so-and-so? She goes to our church. They said, she's a totally different person than she was a few years ago. Totally different person. She used to be so angry, and she's a totally different person now. And they're looking at me, and I'm like, you can't. I, no credit for me. That's how good God is. And no matter who you are, and no matter who you know, God can transform a life in a moment. When God, through his Holy Spirit, just gets a hold of somebody's heart, and they realize they've been going one way, and he says, that's the wrong way, and they finally realize it, and they grow up and say, I give up, and I'll follow you. Today you might be here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You will go through that phase where you think you have a vision for life and that vision needs to die so that you can gain a new vision of Jesus. I need you. I surrender my life to you. I know I'm a sinner and I'm broken and I want to give my life to you. As a Christian, you will go through this cycle over and over. Anytime we, you and I both, Allow any selfishness in our lives. God takes us through refining fire. It is not fun, but the Bible says consider it joy. So if you're going through the fire, you don't have to like the fire. But my prayer is that you'll know the God who is in the fire with you. And you'll be able to walk out on the other side knowing that he was with you all the way. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, we're going to have an offering in a minute. After our offering, we don't do an altar call, but after our offering, you can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, and as I spoke, you know what stage you're in. I want to encourage you, take the next step that God has for you, whatever that is. You say, God, I'm going to be obedient to you and do that next thing. My prayer is that you would get his vision your life, and it would not only change you, but it would change the people in your life. It would change your family, it would change your workplace, that God would get so a hold of you that the people in your workplace would say, something's happened to them, and it would change them too. Let's go to the Lord and pray today. Father, thank you so much. We know that you'll work out your plan in our lives, but Father, it's so easy to try to do our own thing. And so Lord, we choose right now to trust you. Father, I pray right now, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they would surrender to you. Lord, I pray also if anybody's watching online, that right now, Father, they might say, Jesus, I need you and turn their life to you. Father, I pray for that one who's really going through that time of darkness and they don't feel like there's anybody to hold their hand. I want to pray they would know your presence. Father, they'd also know that there are people who love them that will walk with them during the dark times. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I bless our offerings. As folks give, I pray that you bless what's happening here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time of giving now,